In Insidious 1, I pointed out ghosts that were hiding in the background of scenes, and the second movie would contain an even more well-hidden spirit. There's a scene where Renee is on the phone, and as she walks past, you can see the woman in white sitting in the living room. But once she reaches the doorframe, the apparition is gone. Director James Wan and screenwriter Lee Whannell explained why they do this on Insidious Chapter 2's Blu-ray. The idea is if one audience member catches it and reacts, then their friends will go, what? What did you see? And the tension in the movie theater builds. Personally, outside of the theater experience, I always find it creepy to go back and discover something that's not supposed to be there. So in this video, I'll be going over all of the things you might have missed in Insidious Chapter 2. To learn about the artifacts in Elise's basement and more Insidious secrets, stick around to the end of this video. This baby stroller looks like Pac-Man and I'm tired of not talking about it. Welcome to Things You Missed. James Wan, Lee Whannell, and just about everyone from the first Insidious came back for the sequel. For Wan, it was his first time directing a sequel. Whannell had experience with sequels, having penned the second and third Saw movies, and even a miniseries called Insidious Spectral Sightings about Specs and Tucker's paranormal adventures before meeting Elise. If you haven't seen it, don't worry too much. It's pretty boring and was rendered non-canon by the events of Insidious Chapter 3. Chapter 2, unfortunately, isn't my favorite either. I knew something was weird with this one when I heard the younger version of Elise dubbed over with the voice of the 70-year-old Lin Shay. See things. Things no living person is supposed to see. There's actually a UK version of the trailer that includes the original lines from the younger Elise. He sees things no living person is supposed to see. I wish they just stuck with that in the movie. I think the audience is smart enough to understand who Elise is and understand that people's voices can change over time, except Rivers Cuomo. Despite that, the expanded characterization for Elise is appreciated. We get to see her house for the first time, which happens to be the perfect place to jump into some more Things You Missed. In my episode on the first movie, I talked about the red door which connected the Lambert's house and the further to the Lair of the Demon. We see another red door marking the main antagonist here in Chapter 2, so it makes sense that when we enter the home of the franchise's ghost whisperer, Elise, we must enter through these big red gates. She used to do her psychic readings at home, so the red entryways are probably meant to be inviting to spirits on the other side. Now that we've seen a couple examples of the color red representing the gateway between the living and the dead, I'm reminded of another movie that used the color in the same way, The Sixth Sense, which had red doorknobs, red flowers, red tents, and more to show the connection between our world and the world of the dead. Elise's basement, where she does her readings, is also covered in red, just like the demonic layer in Insidious. The basement is decked out with paraphernalia and artifacts, which serve as this franchise's version of the artifact room from The Conjuring, which had come out just two months earlier. Elise may have died at the end of the first movie, but her presence is still felt, and she seems to leave a message for Specs and Tucker. They find an old tape and put it into her Panasonic VHS player, but several letters in the logo are crossed out, causing it to read, panic. After possessing Josh Lambert's body, the bride in black tried to convince Renee that everything was fine and that she should not panic. So this was Elise's way of saying, don't listen to him, panic. The reading room also contains a mannequin wearing a gas mask, a callback to the gas mask seance that Elise performed in the first movie. The second film introduces a new psychic character, Carl, who has his own unique way of contacting the dead using these Ouija dice. Another common element this one shares with Insidious is the cinematography. In the previous episode, I pointed out how the camera was always moving through door frames and looking through door frames in the real world to highlight the bright openness of the real world in contrast to the dark, closed-off nature of the further. We see more of that in Chapter 2, as well as more evidence that the doors are used to link these two worlds. For example, Carl gets a vision of the antagonist, Parker Crane, when he touches a door frame at the abandoned hospital. And at Parker's home, when they discover they are speaking to an evil entity, all of the doors in the house slam shut. There are a couple more connections to the first Insidious. While Spex and Tucker are watching the tape from Josh's childhood recorded in 1986, Lorraine is at home, and the movie Carnival of Souls is playing on her TV. It reminds me of something that I discovered when making a video on the red-faced demon from the first Insidious. James Wan referred to the character as something out of a crazy mystical carnival. It sounds a lot like John, a creepy character from Carnival of Souls who even has a similar hairstyle to Redface. The next morning, when we see the mom, Renee, wake up, the scene looks just like the introductory scene in the first movie, only this time, Josh cannot be seen sleeping there beside her, our first clue that something isn't right. Those who saw my episode on the first movie may remember that Lee Whannell wanted to avoid any false jump scares. If they were going to release the tension, he wanted it to be a real threat. That's not the case in Insidious Chapter 2. Early on, Renee trips on this baby saucer for a cheesy scare. However, there is some significance to this scene. The saucer plays the song, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, the same song that the new villain, the woman in white, can be heard singing in the living room, shortly before abducting the baby. This demonstrates how music can be perceived in both the further and the real world, which sets up the moment when we discover that Josh had been trying to get through to Renee by playing her song on the piano when he was trapped in the further. There are a 
few more instances of foreshadowing. Dalton can be seen reading Turn of the Screw before bed. This is an 1898 horror novel. Maybe you're familiar with the 2020 adaptation The Turning, or the much better 1961 adaptation The Innocents. Dalton is only 9 or 10 years old, so he has no business being interested in this book. However, considering his ability to see things like Elise, it's possible that his clairvoyance ability caused him to choose this book. Because when Carl, Lorraine, Specs, and Tucker later investigate the old crane house, the woman in white unscrews the chandelier, which nearly crashes down on Carl and Lorraine. Then again, he also seems to read Moby Dick, so maybe he just loves reading old classics. There may also be a moment of foreshadowing when Specs and Tucker face off in their own version of Rock, Paper, Scissors. That is a bear beat a goddamn ninja. Superior sense of smell, my friend. After arriving at the old crane house, Specs is the first one to comment on the smell. What is that smell? Which eventually leads them to discovering the bodies of Parker Crane's victims. One more small detail about Specs and Tucker, their van's license plate says Astral P, short for Astral Projection, the ability shared by Elise, Josh, Dalton, and Lorraine, which allows them to leave their physical bodies to explore the spiritual world of the further. I saw what haunts him, and it's not a friend. It's a parasite. I've never felt such a malignant presence. I'm guessing James Wan really likes that word, malignant. He would eventually make a whole movie about it in 2021. At the time though, it wasn't exactly a James Wan Easter egg, but that's not to say that this movie isn't brimming with them, along with even more things you missed. The first Insidious ends with the bride in black strangling Elise, so at the beginning of the second one, there's an investigation, during which Renee is interrogated by Steve Harvey. Her guest badge for the police station simply says Metropolitan Police, just like the police stations in James Wan's Saw franchise, which never seem to specify a city. However, we do later see a newspaper that clues us in on where Insidious takes place. We've always known they live in California, but more specifically, it seems to be Newark, California. After discovering the VHS tape from Josh's childhood visit from Elise, Tucker digitizes the footage to view on his laptop. If you pause right before he pulls up the footage, you can get a glimpse at his desktop background, which is a picture of the ghost hunting duo posing with James Wan. There are also a bunch of Adobe Premiere files, a Photoshop file of something from the hospital, which they haven't been to yet in the movie, and a movie file for the videotape. For the film shoot of Insidious 2, this was clearly the media laptop, something the art director could plug in anytime they needed to show something on a screen. You can tell because these files were all modified in 20. 13, yet the movie takes place in 2010. We weren't supposed to see this stuff, which is why it's only on screen for a fraction of a second. However, you could make the argument that the reason that they have a bunch of video and photo editing software is for their mini-series Spectral Sightings, the non-canon web series I mentioned earlier. In Insidious Chapter 3, we learn that before meeting Elise, they fake their show through fancy video editing. Thanks, little man. Some of my best editing on that one. Definitely some of our best editing. As for the date modified, maybe Tucker accidentally set his laptop's date and time incorrectly? I wouldn't put it past him. Insidious 2 features even more of the usual James Wan tropes that we've grown to expect. He loves to include mannequins in his work, and there are two in this movie, in Elise's reading room and in Parker Crane's old house. We also know that James Wan loves creepy dolls. When we first see the child version of Parker Crane in the further, his room is filled with girl dolls, which we come to learn is because his evil mother is forcing him to act like a girl against his will to get revenge on the father. When we first see the young Parker from behind, he looks a whole lot like Annabelle, who had made her debut appearance in The Conjuring earlier that summer. Since Carl has the ability to see into the past, of objects that he touches, he's able to touch Parker's veil and see his transformation into the Bride in Black, where we also see the Bride's weapon of choice, a saw. However, I don't know if this was an intentional reference. If it was, he might have used a hacksaw, more akin to the ones that Adam and Dr. Gordon were left with in James Wan's breakout movie. There is a weapon that Wan loves to use even more than a saw, and that would be his trusty tranquilizer needle. Jigsaw uses it in Saw and its many sequels, and it's also used in Malignant. In pretty much every movie it's used in, it knocks the victims unconscious almost immediately, yet seems to be completely completely safe for the person being tranquilized. According to this video from Life Noggin, that only works in the movies. Most tranquilizers in use today take a while to work, with some of them even taking as long as 45 minutes in the right conditions. There aren't really any tranquilizers out there currently that could instantly and reliably knock a person out without the risk of side effects or an overdose. In any event, seeing as how Insidious Chapter 2 is a movie, our protagonists try to use a tranquilizer to knock out the possessed Josh Lambert, but it backfires and ends up going into Tucker. Tucker is a lot bigger than Josh, which could explain why it doesn't put him to sleep for very long. As you may know, James Wan and Lee Whannell both come from Australia, as well as cast members Rose Brin and Angus Sampson. For this reason, during the scenes in Josh's old room, you can spot an Australian flag hanging on the wall. They also rode kangaroos to set every single day of production, all four of them. 
The flag certainly serves as sort of a crew reference Easter egg, and you can find more in the scene where the protagonists hunt down Parker Crane's medical file in the abandoned hospital. His physician is listed as T. Spence, which stands for Thomas Spence, Insidious 2's prop master. One of the articles hidden away in a chest in Parker's old house is also written by Thomas Spence. Parker's dentist is listed as J. Garner, which stands for Jason Garner, the movie's art director. And there's another article written by Hilary Parker, an art department production assistant. As I mentioned, I'm a much bigger fan of the first Insidious than the second. Some people fault the first movie for being too derivative, but even if it is kind of a reskin of Poltergeist, it's at least a good reskin of Poltergeist. It's scary, it's weird, and it has lovable characters. Insidious would truly continue to follow in the footsteps of the Poltergeist franchise because Chapter 2 takes after Poltergeist 2. Both families temporarily move in with the grandmother, but the haunts follow them and continue to terrorize them. Both introduce a new ghostly antagonist who motivates the ghost to try to harm the family. There's even a scene where Steven, the dad in Poltergeist, swallows this supernatural parasite thing which causes him to become possessed and attack his wife. It's very similar to the end of Insidious Chapter 2 where they confirm that Josh is possessed and he tries to kill Renee. However, the possession scene is a pretty short section of Poltergeist 2. The finale of Insidious 2 takes most of its inspiration from another movie that is much more well known. It feels like a really bad redux of The Shining, and if you watch my channel, you know that I'm a huge fan of The Shining, so I won't stand for that. Once it comes out that the other characters know that Parker Crane has possessed Josh's body, he goes crazy and tries to kill them. It feels very much like he's trying to act like Jack Torrance. He's wearing this plaid bathrobe that makes me think of the plaid shirt that Jack wore during his rampage. He may be trying to act like the real Josh, whose spirit is also wearing plaid in the further, but it just makes me think of Jack Torrance. He snoops on Carl the same way that Jack Torrance snoops on his wife. What you got there? How do you like it? <laughs> his fake smile is clearly inspired by Jack Nicholson's faux friendliness after losing his mind. Even the way he mockingly enunciates his words seems copy-pasted from Nicholson's performance. What have you got behind your back? Why don't you ask your dice what I have behind my back? Maybe he should be taken to a doctor. You think maybe he should be taken to a doctor? He has a hand injury. <laughs> He becomes woozy after getting hit with a baseball bat. He tries to bash a door down to reach and harm his family. In Insidious, it's with a fire extinguisher, and in The Shining, it's with a fire axe. Here's Johnny! <laughs> At least he didn't say, here's Joshy or something, I guess. I like Patrick Wilson, but it's his subtlety that makes him good. Asking him to replicate one of the great madman performances of all time is like asking the other Patrick Wilson to play lead guitar in Weezer. That's a bad example, because Pat is actually pretty good on guitar. They both are. And they can both play the drums. But my point is, the actor Patrick Wilson is suited to play Josh Lambert and Ed Warren. Not this. Shut up! Shut up! Get out of my head! Shut up! Sorry, I didn't mean to turn this into a movie review, but I've just been wanting to say that for a while. Much like how I would like to forget Insidious Chapter 2, Carl helps hypnotize Josh and Dalton so they can forget about their abilities to astral project. Which, if you ask me, is completely idiotic. Did they not learn their damn lesson the first time? What's going to happen when Dalton has a kid and he has the ability to astral project? You're better off remembering the past so that you can try not to repeat it. The final, final scene shows Spex and Tucker on their next job, and the ghost version of Elise joining them from the further. She hears the crackling sound made by the red-faced demon in a new house and looks up and sees something shocking. The movie ends on a cliffhanger, which I'm fine with, but then Blumhouse pulls the same BS they did with the Purge election year and makes two prequels before addressing that cliffhanger. However, in the case of Insidious, one of those prequels is the best film in the entire franchise, and I'm covering it next on Things You Missed. Check out that video on the left, and remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell, and select all notifications, and I will see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.